This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. No, I'm Nate Blayton. So last week I teased that we were going to have a guest this week and that our guest was going to be the manager of uh, marketing and public relations for Boozy and Hawks <laughs> New York. <laughs> and that was a joke because our own Patrick Gulo is doing that now. Hey. So congratulations, Patrick, hey. starting a new job. Hey, it's good to be here, really. Thanks for having me. <laughs> There you go. It, was a, it was a little high five from Nate for you. Everybody, okay, so now you have to put your hand up to the camera to receive Nate's high five. There you go. Okay. We got that out of the way. A right. decent producer would have had a hand clapping sound ready for that day. I know. I'm total jerk. We'll do um, it in post. Yeah, I'll th throw that in in post. Uh, so the big article that has been going around the new music uh, blog, or actually not just new music, the classical music blog world this week and if you read new music box or uh even huffington post uh arts section you may have read this daniel asia column um what are you doing sam i don't know what do you mean there's some guitars coming from your computer i don't know so anyway, Daniel Asia <laughs> is a composer, and he wrote this. I don't understand what's going on right now. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote uh, a piece about the Cage Centennial, and it's it's a a type of article that I have decided to start calling Cage Bait, um, <laughs> where where he he wants to start an argument about John Cage's music and and its validity, uh, and he's comparing the the Cage Centennial to the Stravinsky Rite of Spring Centennial. So not Stravinsky Centennial, but just the piece. Um, and we were going to talk about that and spend a big chunk of time talking about that today. But instead, we decided, let's talk to Daniel Asia about it. And he was unavailable this week, but he will be here this week. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm seeing if Dave's pissed I think off in the you. last five minutes, our show may have jumped the shark. Um, <laughs> Speaking no, of that is in the heat of the moment by Asia. Okay, sorry. I'm and I found okay. I said I'm gonna do this, and every time Dave says Daniel Asia, I'm gonna hit that guitar. Down, down. <laughs> All right. So, uh, speaking of nothing related to that done, person, because you can you can say his name again. I closed one. I'm not going to. Um, we have some. I'm, news may not be the right word, but we've talked a lot in the past about um, advertising campaigns for classical music and um, the different ways and maybe tricks that organizations use to bring new people in to the symphony or the opera. And uh, Opera de Montreal had uh, an ad campaign recently um where instead of showing photographs of the singers that were going to actually be performing in the opera, they hired models. And the ads had photos of the models. And this led to uh, some rather upset performers who felt that this was disingenuous and that they, as the people actually doing the singing, should have their faces in these ads. Um, and... Uh, the one of the singers in particular, uh, I'm, I'm losing the guy's name. What's this guy? The the tenor that's on um, uh, vocal uh, cord strike. Know. Hold on, just one moment. Uh, I wrote it down and then I threw away the thing that I wrote it down on. Uh, Mark Her Herview, Herview. Herview uh, has has decided that he is on vocal cord strike and will not will not be singing. And when asked to sing, he said. Well, you should get the model from the ad and have get get that guy to sing. Oh dear. Um, so, what do you guys think about uh, <laughs> using these photographs of not the performers uh, in an ad campaign for this opera? Well, if he wasn't so ugly, they wouldn't have to do that, would they? Oh snap! <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm like, that's what the that's what the guy should have said. Stop being so ugly, and I will. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> do you think like it's this, disingenuous though? Understand. I don't know. I mean, pfft. do you think I, people, uh, anyone who goes to see the opera, though, I don't think they're I mean, they probably know who's performing, though, right? Yeah. 
perhaps. But I mean, do you know what they? I mean, I think the idea is that maybe somebody who didn't, who who wasn't already inclined to go to the opera, might see this ad with this beautiful person, and then show up to the opera and say, "Well, where are all the beautiful people that were well, in your they're ad?" They're going to say, "Oh, well, I'm never coming to the opera again," which is just one <laughs> performance away from what they were before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't think that the only person hurt by this, if you want to call it that, are the 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 actual singers. I don't think right. that it's going to make it, there's not going to be anyone who shows up and goes, "Oh, I was showing up just because that beautiful man was on that ad. I'm leaving, you know." <laughs> I could be wrong, but even if there are some people that behave that way, I don't think it's going to hurt their ticket sales in any kind of significant way. And they probably I we should have checked this, but I mean, as soon as you get past the ad to actually buy the ticket, I'm sure you're gonna find production shots and whatever else, yeah, all over the internet or wherever you're gonna buy your ticket from before you actually get there. And if we have uh, viewers out there who know anything about this and you know that this has happened in the past, because to me, this is the kind of thing where just because somebody decided to write an article about it and get a quote from some pissed off tenor doesn't mean it's the first time it's happened. I would be willing to bet it's happened a lot over well, the course we, of history. So I think this is a little bit different. In the past, we've talked about opera companies um, changing out singers for more attractive singers. Mm. So, Well, what's the difference? Well, I think the difference is that this is not actually having an impact on the final product. Yeah. You know, like if they had said, all right, tenor guy... I'm not, you, we're going to get rid of you and find a more attractive tenor, then that would have an impact on what the music sounds like. Oh, I thought you were saying they, just for the picture, they kept no, it no, singers, no, no. but just better Opera companies for years have been um, choosing uh, singers who are more attractive. Yeah. Um, well. and, and in some, t- in some cases, even cutting uh, unattractive singers for more attractive singers. There have been some pretty high-profile, scandalous. Yeah, I don't want to right. talk about names because it's not nice. Yeah. Um, so but that's the business it's happened to some in, pretty though. big name people. That's Say what? the business they're in. What do they expect? Well, you know? so I think Castro. this is the thing. Uh, it, you can say that they are in the theater business, but I think a lot of times these people think of themselves as being in the music business where that matters less, or at least in classical music it matters yeah, less. Well, if you if you're wearing wardrobe and putting on makeup and a wig and you're up there, you know, moving around on stage in front of other human beings, you know, doesn't matter what you think you're doing, people are looking at you and their uh, opinion of the the production is going to be based at least somewhat on the beauty of the people up there. Well, and I think this all kind of exists on a continuum that includes, you know, what Yuja Wang wears to play the piano. We've talked about her many times on the show. And, uh, you know, Han Bin, what, what he wears when he you mean, performs. Like, you this mean is Amadeus, all, Leopold. Amadeus Leopold? Amadeus Leopold, thank you. <laughs> right. uh, what he wears to perform. So, I, this is all, that all, it all exists on a, on a continuum. But I, I think... The main problem is this guy feels like he's the one doing the singing. He's the one that trained for so long uh, to 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 be uh, an opera star. He should be the one getting the credit and getting his photo in the paper, right? Mm, yeah, that sounds legit to me. I mean, I wonder what the shame sales are going to be like with these this new advertising campaign. Yeah, uh, I'd be interested in seeing. I mean, I, if you could, it's still Deflator the Mouse. There's only like. You know, there's only so many people that are gonna that are gonna show up to to see 19th century German opera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of which, you know, how often does the the composer get front and center when they're uh, talking about a new piece? You know, you get one little thumbnail sized picture in the program somewhere. Right. So, you know, I wanna I wanna the next time I premiere a piece, I want a statue of myself out front because nobody's more important to a p a brand new piece than me, right? If I wrote it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we we all know, egos aren't a really a real factor in opera. No, no, right. No. <laughs> uh, so in, in our next story, access, we, we have a story about accessibility in music, and this is not something that I'm not sure we've ever talked about anything like this. Um, but 
Uh, this is a story from the the BBC News, and they have, they're reporting on a competition that a guy is putting together this uh, fund to pay out to uh, instrument designers. His daughter is uh, she have uh, cerebral palsy or something? I don't know, but she has very limited. She has v- um, limited range of motion uh, on one side of her body, and he's trying to. Uh, get somebody to design an instrument that she can use with one hand. And there are obviously a lot of people who do not have the, the full use of their uh, their hands who would want to express themselves in music. And so we play a, a little bit of, of this video uh, from, from the BBC. Let's see if this will work. 19-year-old Amy Hetherington has cerebral palsy, meaning she only has limited use of her left hand. It also means any ambitions to play an instrument have been thwarted. Not having that choice has been sort of upsetting, so it means I I haven't been able to explore um, areas of my life that I would have liked to. Now her father has set up the One-Handed Musical Instrument Trust and a competition. To produce these instruments, to, to teach on those instruments, to produce the players and to have them disseminated to open up the possibility of participation in musical life for people, disabled people is the, is the target. And for those who think it's impossible, we'll take a look at this. So they show some examples of different forms of... Uh, instruments that were designed for uh, people that have uh, limited physical capabilities. Um, and the the ones that they're showing seem to also limit, when I'm looking at them, seem to also limit the range of expressive possibility. And I think the trick for somebody designing one of these instruments is to design something that uses one hand or maybe even no hands. One of the instruments that they that they show here is... is uh, only uses the person's mouth and they move their head up and down to change the pitch. Um, and it seems like it's very limiting uh, as to which, what sounds can be made. And that's, I think, a big difference between what you can do on, we saw or at the beginning of that, and a trumpet or with a violin or something. Um, I don't know. Do you guys, uh, can you guys imagine um designing an instrument like this that is only that you would only play with one hand well it's you know we've worked with lots of people at the shop who are missing fingers um which is not really uncommon um and done like custom jobs where they can like press a key with the palm of their hand or take uh, like there's a clarinetist that comes in all the time who doesn't have a left-handed pinky so (laughs) we took all the left-handed pinky keys off of his clarinet because he doesn't need them for anything um, but it's, it's did, really, so, did you so what does he do? the fingering? Yeah. No, I mean, you, he can still play. There's some things cause as, as any clarinet players know you, there's things you do with right and left handed pinkies, meaning it's either C sharp here or C sharp here or C natural here or C natural here, et cetera, which is kind of how you negotiate, um, <clears throat> uh, that area because sometimes if you tie up your right pinky, your left pinky is able to do something and vice versa. So there's certain things he just can't play or he would have some kind of weird sliding, you know, thing he'd have to do with his right pinky. Um, but, you know, there's no getting around the fact that flutes, clarinets, all woodwind instruments were designed for people with 10 digits. And if you take away five of them, it's hard to imagine making a bassoon or a clarinet yeah, I think like work in any way close to the way it is. I think more beneficial the route would be... Instrument. Yeah, make a new instrument that is designed to be played with one hand that is a woodwind instrument would be a more fruitful way to go. Yeah. What were you going to say, Patrick? I was just going to, basically, it's the same thing as Sam was saying. I, I can't really imagine the com- a complete remake of the instruments we know for one hand. I think that'd be lo- pretty difficult to do. But, you know, there are factors, you know, keeping the timbre of of the sound that, you know, people are looking for in the orchestra. I mean, that's definitely an obstacle to be overcome. But I don't know, like a, a complete remake of of all the instruments that we know for one hand. Well, that, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the goal. I don't think we we need to be like like you said, redesigning. Well, think, Go ahead. I think that's I think that's what in the video the guy was kind of getting to. Like, oh my, 
you know, I'd like my children to be able to participate in music class or whatever it may be. Well, there, um, there are some instruments that you can, I think, reasonably change. Yeah, more than think, others. Like, more than others. Sure. But, I mean, imagine, uh, so in the video we saw a trumpet. The left hand as a trumpet player is not doing a whole lot. There's a little bit, but not a whole lot other than just holding the instrument. And if we can <laughs> find some kind of harness right. or some other way to hold the instrument, then like, I you can play. Immediately, I immediately thought of how to do that. Some sort of a, not a saxophone strap, but like a hooks that go over your shoulders. There's actually a saxophone strap that works this way. Hooks that go over your shoulder that come down and have a crossbar on your chest mm -hmm. with a support coming up, holding the trumpet. So I mean, that that, can... that already exists as, as yeah. a trumpet voodoo gadget. Make, yeah. your, have, make yourself play trumpet better. I have weak better. biceps. I have weak <laughs> biceps helper. And right. then, there, then there's the possibility of a whole repertoire being built out of that too. I mean, there's a, there's a whole repertoire now for um, piano left-hand pieces. Sure. Right. Left hand alone. Uh, it, it, there's a, a famous Ravel etude for, right. for left hand only Not piano. Oh, it's a concerto. Concerto. Right? Oh, sorry, concerto. Um, and uh, a friend of mine is a piano player, and uh, when we were in undergrad together, he like broke a finger on his right hand, um, hmm. like in the middle of a semester, like moving sousaphones or something. And Brutal. Uh, so his jury that semester was that piece, like mm. because <laughs> what else was he gonna do? He had wow. to he had to give a jury. I mean, can't you just like shift over one? And <laughs> I have a I, I have an idea for a great instrument that wouldn't be too expensive to build from the ground up. That is engineered specifically to be played with one hand. Some sort of a uh, uh, a recorder. Because recorders already rely on, you know, it's this, this, and then this and this, you know, that like strange finger combinations are how you make things happen on a on a recorder anyway. And I can imagine coupling that with maybe a couple of keys that you can thumb activate. That you could you could probably get a full chromatic like, you know. So you're saying by using like some crazy mechanical gizmos, you can make combinations of things kind of equate to more complex fingerings well basically you have to take figure out a way to get one hand through one octave chromatically yeah. and then you know when a recorder doesn't have an octave key it uses you make it change right. octaves you know mm. so that you know you if you figure out how to do that chromatic octave and if you watch like there's a guy crazy guy that does like uh charlie parker transcriptions on uh recorder on youtube if you've never seen this guy it's amazing nice but if you watch mm -hmm. his hands it's like i mean it's just crazy because there's no side key so everything you do that's chromatic or not diatonic up and down on whatever key that recorder is in is all crazy bassoon fingerings you know yeah and, and half, half holes a lot yeah so, yeah. you know, that's that's already a technical requirement of recorder at advanced level. And I think it would be perfectly feasible to make something that does that with one hand. Sure. Yeah. I, won I wonder if with a wind instrument, you could just only activate the upper, like the upper partials where the distance between, um, like I'm thinking in brass where the different fundamentals, where the distance is smaller. So you mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. less combinations to get the chromatic mm -hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm be interesting know. yeah and to maybe engineer an instrument that like a french horn primarily operates in in the upper registers huh. but, yeah. so you mean whoever yeah. played this instrument would have to miss lots of notes like a french horn <laughs> right you need someone who's really into it to like start yeah. like what this was that, guy Patrick? the the hetherington the guy who's yeah. the yeah. head of the trust or or the fund whatever um it is you need someone like that to really push for this and i think that's that's great yeah. that he's doing that this is like I mean, the, this is like a really uh, nerdy X Prize. Yeah. Yeah. As well, the, a, guy as... who, the guy who commissioned the Ravel left hand concerto was um, Paul Wittgenstein, and he mm -hmm. he had um, I guess he lost his right arm in the in First World War, and he just basically went after all these composers and said, "Hey, write me left hand piano pieces." Hey, That's on a re on a related issue, Dave, I put a, a link to an image in the doc. Um, we all know that, uh, well, we all probably don't know, but the drummer for Def Leppard, who we've talked about on the show, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, lost his arm, you know, in the peak of their... I don't see it. Uh, I put it in the chat of the doc. Well, I had to restart. And I still had it copied to my uh, clipboard. Um, you know, it was in a horrible audio, auto, audio accident, a horrible auto accident. 
That that that's what Def Leppard's whole oeuvre is. is a, <laughs> an audio accident. A horrible, a horrible audio accident. It was a horrible auto accident and lost one of his arms. And uh, this is a great picture of his drum set where he has like different pedals to activate lots of different stuff. So, um, I mean, that's sort of more of the DIY approach to dealing how to play with one arm. Um, so anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So anyway, I'll try to have a, a prototype of my uh, one-handed recorder ready for next week, guys. I'm, I I can't wait. I'm going. I'm going out to harvest the wood as soon as we stop the show. Right. You're going to Africa to get some rosewood, right? That's right. Um. Compl- another completely unrelated thing. Uh, speaking of unrelated things, uh, Simon Rattle, Sir Simon Rattle is uh decided that he doesn't want to renew his contract with the Berlin Philharmonic. So we don't know what he's going to be up to. Well, Say what? Did they, did they offer him? Yeah, it was it was his it was his decision according to this article. Um that he did uh, so and this is after his current contract which will end in 2018. So mm. we have a few more years, five more years with Simon Rattle uh leading the Berlin Philharmonic and after that who knows? Uh, he's, that, he's, you'll young, have, he's, he's still a young guy. He was. Yeah, he's still a young guy. So he's got plenty of time to to do whatever he wants. Um and we'll be we'll be curious to see where he ends up. I you guys have any thoughts on this one? It's just curious. I'm curious to see what'll happen because you know that all the the would be successors are out there now sharpening their batons. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, how does the pro- how Not does the process of like that. how does the process of of picking a new conductor go? I mean, is it just something that happens behind the doors and the management of the orchestra decides, or how does that work? I don't. This seems like something that could be vastly different from orchestra to orchestra. Yeah, but I it mean, is. especially for a group like the Berlin Philharmonic, they could pretty much pick anybody they want. <laughs> Yeah, um, no and, like an and, and they and they, the they don't of the Berlin Philharmonic. Say what? Just like an application that you fill out to become right, like at McDonald's. Conductor. It's on a computer in the corner, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like when you turn left, right? When you walk in the front door, there's the Thank application you. to be the music director of the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, but I mean, so they they get to work with all these people all the time, right? They have guest conductors on a regular basis, so they they've got a good idea of people that they like to work with already. Um, so we'll, we'll be we'll be curious to see not only who succeeds him at Berlin, but also uh, what he does after he leaves. Um, yeah. The Minnesota Orchestra, on the other hand, is not playing any music right now, but that's going to change. They're, the band's getting back together one night only. Uh, the Minnesota Orchestra <laughs> was nominated for a Grammy. So, first of all, congratulations for uh, that nomination. But the problem is they can't really celebrate that with any kind of concert because they're all on strike. Unless unless they get together for one concert outside... Or they're not on strike. They're locked out. Excuse me. Um, so, the lockout is going to be put on hold for one night only. I think this is February 1st, if I'm not mistaken. They are going to give a very special concert with their regular music director, Osmo Vanska, uh, kind of in, in celebration of their Grammy nomination. The so, Bailey Symphonies numbers 2 and 5. So Is that what the nomination was for? Or that's what they're playing? That's what they're playing. What However, was the nomination for? Do you know, Dave? I don't. Because <laughs> I'm unprepared. I assume yeah. it's that. And and we don't really care enough to have looked it up. That's true. Um, <laughs> this, to me, just points out how dumb it is <laughs> that they're locked out. Like, yes. if, they can, if they can agree long enough to play one show and say, hey, look at our Grammy, why can't they get together and agree enough to do a whole season just like that? The orchestra's recording of those two works have been nominated for best orchestral performance. Yeah, let's see. Boom. You should just the moral of the story is you should just guess and assume <laughs> that you're right. Mm-hmm. Um, you're here first in Sound Ocean. That's right. That's what we do every week here on Sound Ocean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. This is this seems so, such such a, it makes the the lockout seem about ten times sillier to me. I don't know. What do you guys think? 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, this is it's it's a reason to um to move things along. I think this is like a. Uh, I don't know. I think you can apply my standard reaction to ninety percent of the orchestra stories. <sighs> you mean yeah. that's the way I feel about it? Yeah, heavy sigh. Well, but is this like a a, a symbolic gesture kind of performance though? Could this help? We we can only we can only hope. Well, let's transfer from from longtime players in the field who are completely jaded and bitter over the experience, hoping to stay in business but not sure what's going to happen, to young, fresh faces out there entering the orchestral ward for the very first time. Right, Dave? Yeah, we're talking about uh, the Toronto, the a Toronto Symphony, not the Toronto Symphony. Uh, this piece we've th- and we talked about this before uh, by Pulitzer-nominated composer Todd Mockover, MIT Media Lab uh, guy, um, is working on a piece collaborating with the entire city of Toronto uh, to be performed by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, and he's got some some young musicians who have submitted uh little clips that they have put together through an mit media software package called hyperscore uh and he's put them up on his website as kind of one of the first steps putting together these little bits of material that he can take and and weave into this the greater performance what are you doing sam nothing (laughs) <laughs> no, don't don't let me stop you. I don't I know what's just, going on over there, just, but I don't want to interrupt it because it sounds. I'm just feeling some Whitney right there. <laughs> I believe that children are the future. Okay, some, something in your coffee this morning, Sam. <laughs> yeah. <I think. laughs> so here's the Toronto Symphony. Uh, a, I keep saying the A Toronto Symphony. Uh, a composer for a concerto for composer and symphony. That's cool. So you can listen to these, and I would recommend that you do because they're actually a lot of them are actually pretty cool. Here's here's uh, one of them. I admire the relentlessness of this one. Yeah. So what I think is cool about these and what is cool about Hyperscore and the way he's using it here is that a lot of these kinds of like make music without having to worry about dots and lines kind of applications make these like really non-distinctive pentatonic sounding like mush that Auto is like designed Casio keyboard sounds right is designed to like not let you make anything that sounds too terrible right. like you could use this and make something that sounds mm-hmm. terrible uh <laughs> And none of these are, I should say. Um, the but I think it's cool that it is that powerful and that flexible to make things that actually uh, are kind of crunchy and kind of uh, interesting on a surface level that a lot of similar software packages can't do. Um, so <laughs> he's going to take some of these uh, and incorporate them into the piece that he is writing which is which is very very cool and you know when i listened to all of these this morning um my composer brain didn't have any trouble whatsoever clicking on and going hmm what can i do with these things you know so that's a really cool project right right uh another another big old old timey music organization the royal opera house in london at, at covent garden uh, is is also using the internet to great effect to kind of reach out to people in their community. They have spent just this last week. They spent an entire day, about ten and a half hours, streaming the regular day to day workings of the opera company, which is a very cool undertaking. I cannot imagine being the person in charge of doing a ten and a half hour stream. We have enough problems doing a one and a half hour stream here every week. Um, this was 10 and a half hours and there were, um, kind of rehearsal masterclass kinds of things. Um, all sorts, uh, of, uh, media and you can watch not basically the lots archives. of permissions that need to be, have been gotten. Oh yeah. Oh man. I can't imagine trying to get the permissions. <laughs> a, a place so, like the Royal Opera House. My God. Yeah. No joke. Um, 
So there are uh, a lot of archives available for this. You can see uh, rehearsals and master classes and uh, all kinds of things going on at the Royal Opera House. And just, you know, can, it's, and it's interesting. We've talked about this before, kind of how social media and the internet can help us to demystify the the music making process and i think this is a really great way to do it to to say to you know point a camera at it and say look this is not just like us shooting around the the office all day and then we show up at night and sing like amazingness for opera audiences this is a lot of hard work um so it's it's just a very cool thing. It's not magic. It's just a lot of hard work. They might get Joe Sixpack to show up because, like, they show, you know, guys wearing dirty jeans and T-shirts with tool belts and carrying ladders. <laughs> Looks right. like a construction <laughs> site. Right. Actually, according, uh, according to OSHA, a theater is considered a construction site. Really? Ooh. Yes. I was doing training for some students at the RCAH theater and the training they had to have. Is that all, was, or, all, all the time? Well, no, but the training they had to have was the same training that, that someone who expects to be working at a construction site has to have at MSU. You have to have hmm. fire safety training and ladder safety training and general workplace safety training and blah, 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 blah. Well, and sounds- it's true, you know. You got people hoisting really heavy stuff into the air with cables that if they fell, they could kill you. You know, you got to take what you're doing seriously around there. That's very interesting. I had no idea. Um, So it's it's cool that they're kind of um, maybe not democratizing the the creative process, but they're being very open about it and not, you know, a lot of times when we give a performance, we're we're the swan on the surface of the lake and you don't see how... (laughs) hard and fast the the feeder pedaling and you just see this graceful motion on top and we try to make it like that right that's the goal um and i think it's really cool to kind of mixing my metaphors pull back the curtain uh and see the the people moving the the levers around behind the curtain so this this is Mm -hmm. a cool project um kind of again using the internet and new media to democratize the creative process is uh twitter symphony and this is something that Sam brought to my attention. So, Sam, I'll let you explain what Twitter Symphony is. It's a call for score that you're going to have time for. They're, uh, <laughs> they have a call for scores. Twitter Symphony describes themselves, um, and we'll have a link, but it's T-W-T-R Symphony. Um, they, they say it's a collection of classical music, uh, classical musicians dedicated to creating new orchestra music and getting it out to a worldwide audience. Um, I think it's a cool idea. I will tell you guys, your website is a a little bit on the mystifying side to navigate (laughs) and you could, you do yourself a favor by cleaning it up and, and, and making it a little easier to tell what's going on. It's just, you know, it would be because you want people to immediately know what's going on when they pay you a visit. (laughs) Um, so they have a sort of an open call for scores with a list of instrumentation, but the pieces have to be 140 seconds long which is, you know, the reference to Twitter. There's no real connection to Twitter other that's, than they'll, they'll probably disperse the, the pieces through Twitter. That's what but, I was uh, thinking when I looked at it. Like, this, I don't understand why this has anything to do with Twitter other than the number 140. Right. But it's, it's you know, it's, it, it raises their, it probably helps increase their search engine optimization by referencing Twitter. In right. I'm, and. But but the idea of writing a, a you know a two minute and twenty second piece, you know, and a call for that's the standard length, and you can include like a multi movement piece where each movement is two minutes and twenty seconds or less. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I think it's a cool idea. Um, not a huge fan of some of the music that I heard on the site, but you know, the way to get better music is to let more composers know that it's the resources available. And so they what they do, what they're going to do is record these works, right? Right, and they're gonna, I think, release an album sometime in 2013, which is pretty ambitious. If they're still doing the call for scores, then they hope to release the album sometime this year. Um, but uh, the deadline to submit is March 1st. If if you're interested in that, um, and they they say they may end early if they if they receive enough good scores, they'll just stop. So act now. Um, this is an interesting idea. I, to be perfectly honest, I'm a little bit worn out 
when it comes to uh, the arts latching on to the Twitter brevity thing uh, as as kind of a publicity trope. Um, I think Twitter is still very cool, and we should still be very excited about its possibilities to do good things in the arts. Um, but I would, what I would rather focus on, rather than the idea of Twitter's brevity, um, is the idea of connectivity and networking from Twitter, yeah. rather than the, the the brevity thing. Because I think the the brevity thing is kind of a red herring when it when it comes to why Twitter is is cool. Yeah. Um, um, the ahead. thing to me that's cool about the project, I mean, I, I, I've taken part in sort of brevity composition projects, and uh, but never one for orchestra. So to me, it's interesting just in you have a chance to put an orchestra piece out there, but you don't have to invest a year of your life to try and write something for something that might get an orchestral performance, you know, two minutes and 20 seconds. And listening I don't know to some of this would... music, I wish they'd invested a little more time. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I mean, I feel like I could write because not only that, two minutes and twenty seconds is a different musical sort of shape than something that's going to be fourteen minutes long. The, right. the sort of right. uh, expressive requirements upon me, at least the way I think of it as a composer, are a lot less. It's more like a fanfare or whatever, you know, something that's meant to be short, so it wouldn't take as long, not just to write because it's shorter, but to conceive of because it's not as lofty in its aspirations. I guess you know. Right. So that's actually an, an interesting idea, and and you, and this could be like your uh, a recording that you can use for you know submitting to other things because somebody's going to actually play it and record it for for realsies. Uh, so mm-hmm. if that's something that sounds valuable to you, you should you should definitely check it out. Um, and cool. we'll again have links to that in our show notes at uh, soundnotion.tv/sn. Um, Another interesting use of technology in the orchestra, and we couldn't decide whether we had talked about this before. Um, I think we did. I I I've I feel like we did too, but I know it could just be that I've seen it in a lot of places. This is an app for iPad that is called the Orchestra, uh, and hey, hey, the Orchestra, the Orchestra. Say what? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's easy to search on uh, on the right. iTunes Store. <laughs> right, uh, the orchestra, and uh, you can find it in the the Apple iTunes Store for your iPad. Uh, and the the we we're, it was brought to our attention this week by uh, Isaac Shankler, who did a review of it on New Music Box. Um, and again, we may have talked about this before, so apologies for repeating this. But it's um, kind of a project of Esapekka Salonen and the Philharmonia Orchestra. There are recordings in here. Uh, and there are scores and there are videos and you can watch the the performances from different angles of uh, a number of different pieces what i think is particularly interesting is that the the list of pieces that are in it uh not just haydn and beethoven and mozart mm-hmm. um the the list that's in their app description is haydn beethoven berlioz Debussy, Mahler, Stravinsky, Ludislavsky Concerto for Orchestra, mm-hmm. and Solonin's Violin Concerto. So uh, good stuff, and some of it relatively recent. And hopefully they'll keep if it's popular enough, they'll keep updating it. So yeah, yeah, with more stuff. Mm. And though we will, I should say that it's not cheap. It's thirteen ninety nine, but. For these recordings, even if it's just these recordings, that's worth it. These are pretty should be pretty good recordings with uh, Esapaka Salon and, and the Philharmonia Orchestra. So, hey, what do you guys? Think? Can I ask? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. How does my hair look for real? <laughs> <laughs> Is it looking good? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah, great. it looks good. Is it looking okay? Speaking I mean, of it's nice no, hair. it's no, it's it's no Eric Whitaker, but <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, what are you gonna do when you try and compare your hair to Eric Whitaker? Let's you know, see. if Let's... only we could have a venue in which we could <laughs> ask Eric Whitaker what he does to make his hair so amazing and supple and shiny. You know, actually, I think. I understand he does modeling, right? We could probably hire yeah. him for ads for our show. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We could say Sound Notion is hosted by this guy. And then I'm going to stop then I'm going to stop being on the show because I'm going to say, "Well, why don't you have Eric Whitaker?" On We're just show? tying it all together here because Eric Whitaker did a Reddit Ask Me Anything in AMA this week. Uh and 
I don't really know what to say about it other than that you should definitely go check it out. Uh, and the reason we were making all those page. jokes about his hair, it yeah, you're right. It hit the front page of Reddit, which is hard for something about classical music to do. Though it happened twice this week, apparently. Um, and we'll talk about the other one in a minute. But um, one of the questions was about his hair. Actually, a lot of questions about his hair. And so he finally broke down and had to discuss his hair a little bit. Um, but a lot of... Lot of a lot of kids saying, oh my god, we sang your song in my high school choir and it was wonderful. You're so great. But there were also some really interesting conversations in there as well. So uh, if if Reddit Ask Me Anythings are your thing, you should check this one out because it is a lot of fun. And uh, Eric's a, a really good sport for answering some of these questions. So it, it looked like a lot of fun. Do you guys do a lot of Redditing? I look at Reddit, but I don't really participate. Okay. You're one of those... Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it, I am. Too. That's gonna have to change after this. Yeah, seems like it. Um, by the way, if if Hans Zimmer and Eric Whitaker to write a uh, a score for a movie together, it would cause a break in the space time continuum, <laughs> right. according to one Reddit reader. <laughs> um, tell us about Rachel Maddow. Oh it's man, time for the. Uh, hip -hip hip -hip hip -hip So our pick of the week uh, is a video <laughs> that is the, the other thing that I, I was trying to uh, reference earlier when I was talking about uh, things hitting the front page on, on Reddit. There was actually another, another classical music thing on the front page of Reddit this week, and that is a sweet, sweet video of uh, a guy named David Finlayson, a trombone player of the New York Philharmonic, uh, and he got one of these GoPro cameras. If, you, if you're not familiar with a GoPro camera, it's a tiny little, it's like the size of like a, a deck of cards, basically, maybe even smaller. Um, and it is designed to attach to stuff, to attach to a skateboard or your helmet or something. Uh, and it's kind of marketed toward people that do what seem to now be called action sports. Um, <laughs> as as opposed to extreme sports, which is what they were called in the 90s when I was a kid. We have an action sporter on the panel, by the way. Yeah, we have a, a semi-professional action sportist uh, <laughs> in, in Nathaniel T. Blyton. Uh, <laughs> I'm taking a break from the extreme these days, though. Uh, Nate, or the action, or whatever. <laughs> a lot of people don't know this. Nate actually seriously was a professional uh, skater at one time. Is that right, Nate? It was semi-pro. Okay. Technically pro. Didn't but you have not... a sponsor? I, I did. Okay. <laughs> so we're calling you pro. Uh, so since Nate's a professional skater, he probably knows all about these things. So anyway, this guy got one of these sweet little camera things and attached it to uh, the end of his trombone slide and pointed it at his face and performed uh, a, or played a played a Bordoni study. If you're a trombone player, you know the Bordoni Rochu Etude book. Um uh, and you see, like, his face going rah, 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 uh, in and out. Uh, that was what I was doing there when I made that noise, was moving my hands back and forth. If anybody's <laughs> listening to the audio and being like, what, what the heck is going on here? And if you're in the audio, this video is not going to mean anything to you. It was very cool. Uh, and it actually was on Rachel Maddow this week. Her, her The Rachel Maddow show had it as her uh, best new thing in the world on, like, Monday or Tuesday or something. Um, and then later in the week... Uh, Craig Mulcahy, the principal trombone player of the National Symphony Orchestra, took that video, got his own GoPro, and made uh, a duet with the uh, original David Finlayson video. And so that is our pick of the week this week. Um, this is a video on YouTube called Slide Cam Duet. And uh, so this is a Bordogne vocalese transcribed by Rochu and now performed with a second duet part by Tom Irvin by David Finlayson of the New York Philharmonic, Craig Mulcahy of the National Symphony, uh, and some sweet, sweet GoPros. Check it out. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, if you don't think that's cool, then you can't be my friend. <laughs> yeah. How in tune was that last note, too? It, it was, like switched to one was. trombone player. Pretty impressive. Good Lord. Yeah. Pretty impressive. As a pros. Yeah, the, I mean, this is like not some <laughs> high school kid that got this cool thingy and yeah. put it on his trombone. Like, these are serious professional musicians uh, playing with these GoPro cameras. Um, and so the first thing when I saw this was... Let's do some more of these. Like we we need we need this needs to be a thing on YouTube yeah. where people musicians get their GoPros and find interesting places on their instruments to attach them while they perform. Uh, and they should imagine, all perform as well as those guys perform. <laughs> that should be part of the like rule. A dozen All right, let me think about this. Like a like, dozen different GoPros and somehow you had them attached to all the keys like a dozen different keys on a woodwind instrument and then they'd kind of all the cameras would kind of just like click 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 and you could make a uh, like 12 different modules in a screen and you'd see all the camera cameras moving like shifting all the time you'd have to have a bunch of fiber optic cameras to do that like colonoscopy cameras you know so if there's a saxophone slash colonoscopy office worker <laughs> You know what your job is. A piano. Put them on the on the the dampers inside a grand piano. Oh, that's interesting. I was, yeah. I was thinking on timpani sticks, like. Oh. <laughs> like you could probably do like corsages on the wrist, you know, so you can see the, or snare drum, like a, a hardcore kind of you know rudimental snare drum on a Kevlar head. Now, now you're talking. This needs to be. This should be a drum core thing, and you put them <laughs> like facing. The the people or facing out on like the bells of instruments in drum mm-hmm. corps, yeah. Uh, so oh. anyway, I, I've been thinking all week about how cool it would be to like have a whole orchestra's worth of these things. Uh, and the, the one of the ones that I thought of would be cool would be putting the the camera on the scroll of like a violin or a viola or a cello or a bass and like pointing mm-hmm. down uh, the the fingerboard toward the bridge. And you see the the right hand and the left hand going to town on a string instrument. And Nate, what you had one too? I don't remember what it was. Oh yeah, I, well, so with a string instrument, putting it, trying to work out a way to get it on the hand of the bow, to point up the bow. Oh yeah, you need thing. And so that mm. would be that would be a lot closer to what's going on here, where you kind of get the in and out, in and out, in and out thing. Yeah. Um, what's yeah. interesting about the trombone one, though. Is that it's so sudden and yeah. like oh yeah so like the that that's the thing that you're not hearing ideally like that's why you would practice something like this was to 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 make sure that the audience doesn't hear the slide right Patrick well, you're a trombone I, yeah. player yeah well so, I'm surprised actually that there's no um like vibration in the that affects the camera because I can imagine something that delicate on a GoPro. Would like cause the picture to like go like very fast or something like that at certain I, frequencies. I have to imagine these GoPros must have some pretty good like motion stabilization isolation stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're made to strap to a, a BMX guy's helmet while he's doing this super ramp at the X Games, you know? Or your your like, your flying squirrel suit as you jump out of a blimp. <laughs> he's yeah. doing double backflips over a, an eighty foot gap. <laughs> There's actually, I just found a video uh, posted. So this guy wins um, a marching band practice where a trombone player did the same thing um, back in October of 2011. But it's not nearly as compelling, and the the slide movements aren't nearly as uh, laser sharp <laughs> as the video we watched today. Yeah. I yeah. love That's seeing the most, their facial expressions. Too. It's the most. It seems like it'd be a good teaching tool because, like, if you have a student do that, the camera doesn't lie. You know, you can see that go. Pow, 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 and he just hit his positions. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it'd be interesting to see like a student trying to get that way. I wonder how well you could evaluate their slide movement by having that video content. This well, you can't is really how you this. teach your your music lessons on the internet. Mm-hmm. There you go. This you you make a video of yourself playing on with the GoPro. There you go. Uh, and I think actually um, the, there's a comment somewhere that on the David Finley's in the original, that was the guy on the left, if you're watching the video, uh, wrote that he was using um, a, a fiberglass outer slide. Uh, yeah, because carbon with fiber, the brass, fiber or carbon fiber, sorry. I did it all the time. A carbon fiber outer slide instead of uh, the regular brass outer slide, 
uh, the, and the outer slide is the part that actually moves um, because the it was too heavy with the brass one. So uh, an interesting, interesting observation. Any he other took thoughts? Away the on... weight of the, he took away the weight of the brass and added the weight of the GoPro. Right. I, I, I would guess that the GoPro is still a little bit heavier than the brass outer slide, but it seems like it'd be a lot closer. And I don't know if that's what uh, Craig Mulcahy did or if that's um, just you know him working through the the heavier outer slide i don't know that's the that's the trick is that it's a it's an extra bit of weight wherever you put it um though nate Nate actually as an action sport professional uh (laughs) owns one of these things um (laughs) and says that they're not that heavy yeah they're very small actually it's like uh how much do they cost you can get them like 150 new or $100 $100 ish online, I think, hmm. used maybe. But I mean, they're so small though. Um, and what you, what you usually see is them inside a case to attach them to a helmet or something else. But just the camera by itself is like an inch and a half tall, two inches wide. And they're, they're crazy. <laughs> How much are yeah. they? I, well, I got mine used. We have the information before us. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get one. It's done. Yeah, it's decided. <laughs> um, you know, with Next all this week. talk of trombones, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention because we sell these at the shop, and I wanted to know if the trombone player on the panel has heard of these. Mm. A P bone. Have you heard of these, Patrick? Is, is there, are these the plastic ones? Plastic trombones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they they sound like trombones. They do not sound like crappy plastic trombones. How much Every do they cost? I, I've never heard one. I've never like a hundred bucks, maybe. I don't know. Oh man, I yeah. want it so bad. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you, them at like a Sam Ash and stuff. Just put P Bone into YouTube, and you'll find tons of them. But uh, we actually, I hate to admit that, and they come we, in zany colors, right? Yeah. Well, we if you're making to, them plastic, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> but you know what right. they don't make, and this is a point of contention at the shop since we're in Lansing. They don't make white, but they do make green, and they make. Well, it's yellow, but you could call it maize. <laughs> so you can take two trump, and we've sold several this way by taking a blue one and a yellow one and mixing up the parts to make a Wolverine's trombone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, they don't make a white, so you can't make a Spartan's trombone out of one of them. You can Jerks. just have a green one. I know. Anyway. What were they cool. thinking? That's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. We're going to leave it on that note where you can go to Meridian Winds and get yourself a a Go Blue Michigan (laughs) uh, trombone made of plastic that will sound great and that you can use to make an awesome video with your GoPro camera. Um, Thank you so much for for enjoying the show this, this week. Thank you to everyone who is watching live and joining us in chat. We really appreciate that. We do this show every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch it at soundnotion.tv slash live, and you can go there and jump in chat. Next week, you will definitely want to watch live, and definitely you will want to be in chat because we will be talking to Daniel Asia about his piece in the Huffington Post last week um, comparing the Cage Centennial to the Rite of Spring Centennial. Uh, It was highly contentious. Uh, About half of my feed reader this week was clogged up with uh, responses to Daniel Asia's uh, article. So but this will... is the opportunity for Daniel Asia to respond to the responses. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And if you would like to be a part of that conversation, you're going to need to be in chat to do that, which unfortunately requires a Ustream account, but fortunately that is free. Um, so you should definitely do that for next week. If you'd like to comment on this show after the fact, um, or if you want to read uh, any of these great stories that we talked about, you can find links to do that at our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also connect with us on Facebook or on Twitter. We're, uh, as a group, Sound Notion on Twitter. We're also all individually on Twitter. I'm at, I'm at Dave McDow. Nate is at Innate Tree. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. And Sam is at Housegoy. So you should connect with us there as well. We would love to continue any of these conversations wherever you uh, enjoy the social mediaing. Uh, you can so, so please go ahead and subscribe to this show on uh, iTunes Store so you catch every episode as we publish it. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week for our highly contentious Daniel Asia episode. <laughs>